Yeah, so today's speaker is, um, oh, sorry, Dr. Jonathan McKeon no. Green from the philosophy department. Um, he does quite a range of stuff like philosophy of language, logic, which he gave a talk on uh, here last year, and uh, philosophy of music. And today he's going to be talking about a philosophy of language topic. Don't do juggling, though. Uh, I've never got that down. OK, well, um, here's uh, one of my favourite bits from one of my favourite things, and you, you may know this. It goes like this. And all dared to brave unknown terrors, to do mighty deeds, to boldly split infinitives that no man had split before. And thus was the empire forged. I'm just trying to make the most of this mic, because it's pretty cool for voiceover stuff. Um, but I don't have a Peter Jones voice, unfortunately. But that's, um, I know that as uh, an extract from actually the first episode I ever heard of the Hitchhiker's Guide on radio. And for me, it's always going to be a piece of radio rather than a piece of book or a piece of television or anything like that. Uh, and it was at about that point that I realized it was supposed to be funny. Because, um, you know, boldly splitting infinitives and being a bit of a sort of a pedant in those days, I was about, I was, I was exactly about 15. And uh, I knew about splitting infinitives. It's one of those things up with which you're supposed not to put. And people used to get into fierce arguments about it. And nowadays people tell you to be more relaxed and just, just not worry about whether to not split infinitives. But pe people, people used to go on about it. And it's one of those sort of odd little rules that, that some people think are really important and other people don't. And there are lots and lots of rules about language that fall into this category. Should you say different from or is it okay to say different to or as American colleagues of mine like to say different than? That's, that's the thing people worry about. In uh, the music library where my wife works, she worries about um, the plural of the word thesis. This comes up all the time, and people say theses and theses and who knows what else. Um, my favorite example of that kind of thing is the plural of the word octopus. When I was, at, uh, when I was a graduate student, one of my teachers uh, got really excited about the plural of octopus. He said, you know, lots of people like to say octopi or possibly octopi, but this would only make sense if it was a Latin word with a Latin plural from the second declension. But in fact, it's Greek, so the plural ought to be octopodes. But in fact, it's an English word, so why don't people just say octopuses? And this is another example of a certain sort of phenomenon that you find people writing the newspapers about, people getting very, very excited about certain sorts of linguistic rules. And what I find interesting about these debates and about the rules that are the topics of these debates is that descriptive linguists couldn't care less about them. Now, what are descriptive linguists? Well, descriptive linguists are the people, we have some working in our linguistics department here. They try to describe what's going on in languages systematically by, by trying to come up with grammars for the languages, a lexicon, which will give you the, the sort of atomic units of the language, a phonology, which will tell you something about the sound system of the language. And they'll try typically to do it in some kind of a way that means that their story is an instance of some other story about, about some bigger story about other languages. So they'll be able to tell you, you know, whether it's a syllable timed language, whether it's a subject verb object language, there'll be all sorts of typographic stuff that they're interested in to classify this language alongside other ones. Um, so they won't just come up with a theory from scratch, they'll try and come up with a theory that fits in with some bigger theory about what languages are supposed to be like. And then of course there are big debates about what languages are supposed to be like and that makes the job very difficult for the descriptive linguist. But the descriptive ing linguist is interested in a large number of the, the rules that, that govern languages and they're interested in what certain constructions can tell us about those rules. So for instance, they're interested in what we might call gunner contraction. So consider this little argument, since I do logic, we'll have an argument. Um, I'm going to get wasted, therefore I'm going to the pub. Now you can contract the premise in a way that you can't contract the conclusion. I'm gonna get wasted, therefore I'm gonna the pub. You don't say I'm gonna the pub, why not? In both cases you've got going to, and it seems that in one case you can contract it and in the other you can't. So there's some syntactic thingy going on which is different in the premise of that argument from the conclusion. What is it? This is the kind of thing that descriptive linguists are interested in. And they're interested in things like question formation. So take a sentence like, biscuits are provided. We would turn that into a, a question by inverting the first two words. 
uh, are biscuits provided. But if we had a sentence like, the machine that got broken yesterday is fixed, and we want to turn that into a question, we wouldn't go, machine the that got broken yesterday is fixed. We would, we would find the, the main verb and swap that for the subject phrase, is the machine that got broken yesterday wasted? And getting the precise rule right is the kind of thing that descriptive linguists are interested in. And they're interested in the fact that there are sentences which are apparently well-formed sentences, that is, they're sentences of the language, but we, um, even though we wouldn't normally utter them, and this is the one I made up, and I've, it took me most of my effort to make up this one, so I always use this one. And it goes, once the gentleman, the, um, once the despots, the gentleman, the queen, knights resisted, resisted. Now that's a sentence um, of English, we just wouldn't normally utter it. Once the despots, the gentleman, the queen, knights resisted, resisted. How can I show that that's a sentence? Well, um, once is just a, a, an adverb that's telling you that this happened a long time ago. So we're left with the despots, the gentlemen, the queen knights resisted, resisted. And you can, if, you, if you stick in a few relative pronouns, you can start to see why this is clearly a sentence of English. Um, the despots that the gentlemen that the queen knights resisted resisted. So it's the, the despots who resisted, and those despots were the ones that were resisted by the, well anyway, you had to be there I guess, but it's just, it works, okay. Um, and more interestingly still, uh, you can make a sentence um, just by taking the word fish and having it as often as you like. So fish all on its own is a sentence, right? Um, it's an imperative. Fish! Off you go, fish. Um, fish, fish is a sentence, right? Because you can imagine a fish fishing and you could say, well, look, there's a whole bunch of these fish and they fish, right? So fish, fish. Well, if they fish, what do they fish? They fish, fish, right? So fish, fish, fish. So I don't know, um, sharks might, what, 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 well, actually give me a food chain. Give me, um, I'll, I'll, if you can give me three kinds of fish, that would be quite good, a little mini food chain. Can you give me one fish that, that preys on another such that that second one preys on a third? Minnow kawai kingfish. Okay, so the kingfish preys on the um, kawai and the kawai preys on the minnow. So, um, so we could say um, kingfish, fish, kawai. Well, kingfish are fish and so are kawai, so fish, fish, fish. Well, fish, 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 fish. How do we know that? Well, we know that because um, the uh, kawai that the king fishes fish, fish. So fish, 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 fish. And what do they fish? Fish, right? Um, how does that go? Um, the, um, the kawai that the king fishes fish, fish, minnow. Or in other words, fish, 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 fish. So you can do that forever. And descriptive linguists are really interested in how you can do that. But they couldn't care less about theses and octopodes and whether you should boldly split infinitives and that kind of stuff. There's a bunch of things that they're not interested in. And um, that that's interesting. That interests me as a philosopher because uh, I'm interested in what linguists do and why they do it. That's part of what it means for me to be a philosopher of language. And uh, so I'm interested in why they'd be interested in, in one bunch of rules but not another bunch of rules and whether that other bunch of rules, the, the ones regarding pluralization of words like thesis and so on, um, are of any interest at all. That's the kind of thing I'm interested in. And I'm partly interested in it because when I was nine and my brother started school, I was a pedant and I put all these rules on the same rung. I thought they were all very much the same. And when David came home from school and said things like, um, um, I busted you up and stuff, um, I was very quick to, um, to have views about what he should say. And it, it just didn't matter what the rule is, whether it was a standard grammatical rule or just some rule about whether you should use a certain kind of word in a certain way. Um, I thought they were all much the same. So what's the difference? What's the difference between the ones that the descriptive linguists care about and the ones they don't? Well, the ones they don't seem to be playing around the edges in some particular sort of way. They are lexical rules, perhaps. They're rules about how particular words behave, and in some cases they're, they're irregular. 
Um, or, in the case of infinitives, they're rules which don't tell you anything very deep about the language. They're just kind of stylistic things that, that don't have any impact anywhere else. So they're, they're sort of odd little irregularities. They're peripheral. And so they don't tell you anything deep or interesting about language, and, and they could just as easily have come out a different way. That seems to be the line that the descriptive linguists are running ab about these things around the edge. They're, not, they're barely linguistic. Um, they're more kind of social things, like saying thank you and um, not burping at the table. They're those kinds of rules. It just happens that they, um, they connect up with, with language. A deeper thing you might be able to get away with saying about why the descriptive linguists care about these rules, but, about some rules but not others, is that the ones they care about have played an important role in understanding the puzzle of how we learn language. Um, so take the subject auxiliary inversion thing for, for questions, which I mentioned a little while back. Um, um, are biscuits provided as opposed to um, is um, the machine um, that was broken yesterday fixed? If we think about those sentences, um, it seems like children can learn the question rule quite easily and when they're very young. Um, two, three, four. They can learn that you don't just invert the first two words. And yet they can learn that without much exposure to a wide range of constructions. And yet it's a fairly, it's a fairly, fairly complicated rule. It's not just like you take a couple of words and swap them around. You actually have to know something about the structure of sentences. That's really interesting. Um, descriptive linguists care about that uh, historically. Stuff about um, how people learn their first language has played a big role in determining the kinds of things that descriptive linguists have taken an interest in, because they're interested in often the kind of grammar that we can internalize. And compared to that, just sort of learning whether, how you should pluralize octopus, that's just the kind of thing that you might pick up, like, um, you know, which is the quickest way to the chemist. It's, it's not a deep fact about the way we manage to pick up languages. It's, it's a kind of a shallow fact about uh, the way we, we learn certain fairly ordinary facts. At least that's the claim. Not everybody agrees with that. We had a linguist called Jim Miller, a Scottish linguist who worked in the department in Auckland for a little while, who strenuously disagreed with us. And he thought that um, learning all these odd little peripheral things is really, really important. Um, they play an important part in literacy. And he was interested in how we teach that kind of stuff at school. And he thought that linguists ought to pay more attention. But typically, they don't. Um, and you can kind of see their point. You can see that, you know, if I just made up a new word and gave it a stupid plural, well, that, that wouldn't be a very deep fact about language, would it? It would just be a little thing that, well, if you wanted to talk to me, maybe you'd have to learn this stupid word and how to pluralize it. It's just, it's just a fact, um, not, a, not a fact that helps us to understand how language works. At least that's the thought. So descriptive linguists typically don't care about the sorts of, uh, of breaches of rules that people write letters to the editor about. That's, that's the interesting thing. There is, however, another bunch of, of linguists who do care about it, and they're called sociolinguists. And they're interested in how language reveals um, our social status and how our social status constructs the way we speak language and so on. And they will um, very quickly admit that these kinds of um, things, like you know, wh whether you pluralize things in particular ways, um, whether, you, um, whether you split infinitives and so on, uh, in certain circles, they will admit that these things make a certain amount of difference. You know, whether you use, use long, convoluted sentences or really short ones, both, both kinds of sentences might be well-formed, but um, still, it's, it might be interesting that you use one kind rather than the other. And sociolinguists care about this in the same way that uh, sociologists are interested in dress code and table manners. You don't want to get this stuff wrong because people will think badly of you. We correct grammar and spelling when we um, mark essays. We don't always penalize people for bad spelling. We sometimes penalize them for bad grammar, at least if it makes it really difficult to understand what the heck they're going on about. But we certainly do this. We kind of care about it. And sometimes um, certain sorts of people will say, well, you know, people have to absorb the academic style. It's part of, it's like not plagiarizing. You have to be able to write in this way. It's a certain genre. It's a kind of a handshaking thing. And um, so sociolinguists, are interested in the sorts of phenomena that we're talking about. Um, they're not interested in tracking the rules and enforcing them, but they're interested in how they vary across different sectors of the population and so on. Because how you speak or write reveals things about you. Just as you should dress up for an interview, 
Um, maybe you should think carefully about what sorts of sentences you use in an interview. Even if the descriptive linguist would say, doesn't matter what you choose, they're all fine. So there's a little story. I got told that story pretty early when I was doing stage one linguistics. I was told that there's a bunch of stuff about language that linguists mostly don't care about, but your mother does, because your mother wants you to speak proper, and because your mother does, the sociolinguists care about them too. And that's a story that I lived with for a very long time. And I always wondered, can we say anything more about why it would be reasonable to enforce certain standards about style and usage? Um, things about pluralization, things about whether you should say different from as opposed to different to, whether it really makes a difference. Can we say anything more in support of all the people who, um, who still write, to, write letters to the editor about this, or in support of those, those um, style Nazis who want to try and sort of fix this stuff up when they don't like it? Can we, can we say anything more than what the sociolinguists say, which is that, well, you know, obviously you'd better fit in with the crowd when it matters, or else you'll be seen as not fitting in with the crowd. Is there anything more to be said about this phenomenon of those sorts of peripheral rules? I think there is. And I think what we can say might also give us reasons for going in for certain sorts of language reform. That is not merely conservatism trying to enforce certain rules, but thinking about how language might evolve and be made better in certain sorts of ways. So what more could we say well, what are, what are people trying to do when they write letters to the editor and complain about certain sorts of things or when, when they enforce style guides? Well, they're, they're trying to make sure that the language doesn't get worse or that you don't use a sort of a worse form of the language. And if they suggest a certain innovation for a language, then presumably what they're trying to do is make um, the language better. So we can ask, Better or worse in what way? Relative to what? Well, presumably relative to some purpose, some function that, that language serves, um, which is sort of relevant to how we live or something like that. So, so when these people are doing this, presumably they have in mind some function, some standard that they think language ought to meet because it's connected up with some purpose of language. And um, maybe we've got ideas maybe sort of deeply buried inside us about what language does or what it could do, um, that sort of thing. Um, and if we did, then we might be able to say something about what aspects of language promote some of those functions and which ones don't and therefore, you know, what we could do and um, what we couldn't do to, to, to try and implement some of those functions. So that's very, very, very abstract, but that's, that's um, that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of our time, and hopefully we'll, we'll, um, you'll have some, some ideas and things to, sh to share with me about it. Um, and um, it's a topic in the philosophy of language, but I have to say that it's, it's not a very common topic. It's not one that many philosophers these days seem to be pursuing. Um, I mentioned it to my old um, doctoral advisor when I, when I caught up with him in Los Angeles last year, and I said, you know, not many people are working on this, Scott, and he said, and I said, so I was thinking of writing something about it, calling it something like a prolegomenon to a first step towards um, an initial look at functionality and language reform. Uh, what do you think? And Scott's response was, you have a tendency to go for the politically incorrect issues. And that's all the advice I've ever got from anybody about whether to pursue this. But I thought um, it would be a nice gentle topic in the philosophy of language to start with. Richard asked me to, to talk about philosophy of language. so. So here we are, and, and some more familiar aspects of it will sort of come up as we go along. So thanks for inviting me. Um, I've brought David, not David, this isn't David my brother, it's David my friend, and he's, um, he's, he's seen, he knows this stuff, we've done this before, and um, so, uh, and I like to have company. So, I'll, so I'm going to talk a little bit about functions that language might serve and how those could promote language reform or conservatism about language in the um, ways that we've been thinking about. Um, but before I do that, any questions or reactions so far? Anything that, that's sort of sticking out that you think might be worth commenting on at this stage? Okay, well you are welcome to stop me anytime and um, you know, we can have little conversations and I'll try, I'll try not to go forever, obviously. Alright, so the agenda is basically to, it's going to be 
it's going to be quite vague and hand wavy. I'm not going to make any draw any conclusions really. I'm just going to sort of map out a certain terrain so that we've got a way of thinking about what's going on when people um, try and suggest that we ought to be conservative in our language or that we ought to reform it. And a good place to start with would, would be, well, what do we think language does as, the, as it is? Um, what do we think it could do? You know, maybe language um, there are things language could do quite well, but actually it doesn't do them very well and, and maybe we could improve it to make it better. And um, in the limit, you might ask a question like, what is language for? Does it, does it have some, as we sometimes say, proper function? Well, there's a bunch of things that we probably associate with, with language, like you know, giving information, requesting information, receiving information, getting people to do things, you know, could you shut that window? Um, could you go away till the meeting's finished? Expressing oneself, you know, all over the, um, uh, the billboards. Those are the sorts of things that we uh, might think language does. And um, you, you could go into it in more detail, but you'd have to have some story about where you were getting these ideas from. Do you just look around and see what we do with language? Um, do you think about what language is actually designed to do? That's going to be kind of tricky. Now, some people might claim that language has, as I say, a proper function in the way that a knife has the proper function of cutting. We think, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do with knives, but in some sense it seems like they're for cutting. Insofar as something is a knife, it's designed to cut, it seems. And we might think that the same kind of thing could be said about languages in general, or about particular languages. And this view has been developed within philosophy of biology, really, and some people think that the proper function of something like language is whatever purpose, if any, explains why it got selected for. So um, roughly what I mean is you might think, well, okay, so there was um, a bunch of environments and there was a bunch of um, uh, organisms um, hanging around in those environments, and then some of those organisms went linguistic, and because they went linguistic, they did better and they, they out-survived all the other organisms in that environment. And if that happened, and it might not have, but if it had, then we could ask, what was it about going linguistic that meant that those species got some sort of an evolutionary environment, uh, evolutionary advantage? That's, a, that's a, a common story about how you might cash out the idea that language has a proper function, and then you could start looking around to try and see what this thing might be, this purpose for which language was selected. That, that idea of trying to come up with a proper function applies to all sorts of things, not just to language. And it's got lots of problems, but it's quite popular. I'll just mention a couple of the problems. One of them is that, of course, it might be that, um, as I said, language wasn't um, selected for. It wasn't that language gave us any particular evolutionary advantage. Language just kind of evolved and like, you know, as a result of a bunch of random mutations we got a, a language faculty and um, it, it just sort of went along for the ride. We, um, we've survived for other reasons. We use, we use our linguistic ability in various ways but none of them actually explains why we, um, why we were selected for. That's a possibility. That's the possibility that's captured by the idea that um, Stephen Jay Gould and Lewontin talk about of language being a spandrel. So, so one worry about the story is that you, it depends on the idea, it depends on the sort of empirical claim that language was selected for and maybe it wasn't. Well if it wasn't, then do we just say, oh it doesn't have a proper function. Um, it's not like a knife. Do we believe strongly enough in that, in the, that story about something being selected for given, and, and the, 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 the reason for its selection giving us a story about its function. The other problem is, just more generally with the story, um, it may well be that language helped us to out-survive some other creatures, but that might have nothing to do with why we, um, what we use language for now. So a silly story that some, uh, some ex-colleagues of mine have told is, uh, forget language for a minute, let's just think about the heart. Um, well, we think of the heart as a pump. It pumps blood, let's say. Um, but maybe the reason that we uh, out-survived a whole bunch of other creatures was that the heart made a certain noise, the human heart. So there were all these things around, there were various sorts of blood pumps, but ours made a certain noise and we could fiddle the story out. Maybe it drove all these, these other species mad because they had really, really excellent hearing and they kept hearing these hearts beating. And so we out-survived all of them. 
Well, that's possible, but we don't think of the heart as a, as a thing that makes a particular kind of a noise when we think about what it's for. We think of it as a certain kind of a pump. And so we should, because that's kind of what it, that's what it does in the, um, the sort of economy that we're interested in. This, the, the, the role it plays in the systems that mean we care about the heart is primarily the role of a pump. So you might think there's something kind of weird about the idea of using uh, something that, that happened at some point in the past to explain what something is for now. But, but people do this kind of thing. And um, so you do get these evolutionary stories. So I, I mentioned those just to fill out the idea that the story about how you might start thinking about functions of language. Because clearly there are, you, you might think that language really was for something, or you might not. But if you, either, uh, whether or not you do, you can ask separately, what does it in fact do for us, and um, what could it do? So there are, there are all those different dimensions to the, the issue of, of um, the functions that language serves, might serve, or perhaps should serve. And whatever purposes we find on these various lists, we can ask whether language is equipped to serve those purposes well, um, whether it's in danger of becoming worse at serving them, or whether some improvement is possible and desirable. And that's, um, that's my backstory to why it might be okay for people to start thinking about um, enforcing some of these rules, even if they're very peripheral. And I'll, I'll come to how that story might play out in a second. Um, but, but first, if you, if you were quite keen on this biological story, you might find this whole approach really weird. Uh, you might think that um, you'd be, that, well, if language is just a sort of a biologically evolved thing, then it doesn't make a lot of sense asking about how we could make it better. Uh, you might think that language is just an aspect of our biological, biological endowment, and you might find it rather sort of difficult to understand what, how to make sense of this talk of making it better. Um, True, it might be very nice if a biomedical engineer managed to develop a device that pumped blood more efficiently than the human heart does. And then maybe if we could come up with a technique for extracting the hearts of newborns and replacing them with mechanical surrogates that are more reliable and more durable, that might all be very cool. But it makes little sense, you might think, to claim that the human heart would be a better human heart if it plumped, pumped blood more efficiently. Um, it would make more sense to say it would be better if we had some thing, the heart or something different, that pumped blood better. But the idea of making the heart better might just seem like a very kind of an odd question, given an odd thing to think about, given that it's, 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 a, um, it's just a piece of our biology. But nonetheless, people do seem to think that there are purposes that language serves or, or should serve or could serve that it could serve better or that are in danger of being um, served worse. And I'm going to divide these people into roughly two groups and then kind of ignore the division. The division's important, but I'm not going to make a big deal of it, mostly as, as in the rest of this. The division is just between um, people who are talking about um, retaining old rules, and we could call those preservationists. They think that that language is going to serve some function worse if you get rid of it. So those are kind of preservationists. And then there are people who think that we ought to introduce some sort of an innovation, and they're going to be called reformists. And of course, you might be both. You might be a preservationist with respect to some things and a reformist with respect to others. Um, but but it's, it's, a, it's a worthwhile distinction to have in mind here. Um, so what are the kinds of things that might lead people to to want to preserve certain things or to want to reform certain things about language. Well, the ones that I'll talk about have to do with um, preserving linguistic integrity. That's the, that's the vaguest, and I'll talk about it first. Um, another one is promoting communicative efficiency, which is something we probably associate with language. Another one is promoting learnability of language, making um, sure that language is are easy to learn, not too hard to learn. And the last one is ensuring precision. So those are the things that I'm going to um, suggest explain a lot of the, the, the worries people have about um, standard slipping, etc., cetera, um, or the need for innovation. The medicines prescribed for reform um, will include things like resisting unprofitable innovation, 
propagating a universal language, something people might suggest, that's a form of, innovate, of um, reform, self-consciously reforming and enforcing linguistic practices like spelling and punctuation, that sort of thing, um, and developing artificial languages. So um, universal languages and artificial languages are being distinguished here, and I'll, I'll come to what I mean by that, why I'm making that distinction. All right, so, so um, for the rest of me, I'm just going to spool through um, those different sorts of reasons people might have and have a bit of a look at the kinds of things people might say. And, and I'd like us all to think about whether the, the sorts of things they have to say are, are actually justifiable. So the first thing I said was, um, you might care about what I've been calling linguistic integrity. And I said that that was very vague. Um, but it might be the most widespread gripe about language as it's spoken and written. Um, it might also be the hardest to argue for. So the, the worry about linguistic integrity is roughly that as language changes, standards slip. So somehow the integrity of the language is being violated or disrespected, and it's a disgrace. You know, it's said that we should resist linguistic drift, change that occurs haphazardly, change that doesn't track a concomitant change in the needs that language can serve. Worries are often expressed in letters to the editor about the need to preserve the rules of individual languages from corruption by misuse. Um, different from is a good example of this. Another one that I came across recently is people who complain about the way we use the word, the expression Boxing Day. Um, apparently, Boxing Day used to refer to the first weekday after Christmas, and now we use it indiscriminately to refer to the day after Christmas, whether or not it's a weekday. Uh, it's, that's, it's terrible. It's just, just really, really terrible. But we're seldom told precisely what the problem is supposed to be. Like, what, what exactly is wrong with, with, the fact, with us now using Boxing Day differently? I mean, particularly since when you look back at the, at the history of, of etymology of, of words or uses, you find all sorts of crazy things. My favourite thing of that kind is um, we don't really have pub signs here, but, you know, in Britain they have pub signs. And there's one uh, quite common, the goat and compass. Um, the goat and compasses. So a lot of pubs in Britain are called the goat and compasses, and apparently this comes from God encompasseth. So you can imagine somebody writing to the paper after seeing one of these pub signs and saying, it's a disgrace, the language is being, is being eroded. But actually, we think it's kind of a fun, quaint thing, and we feel quite pleased with ourselves when we know the history. We think things just do change. Um, so the question arises, is there any actual sort of functionality of language that's supposed to be uh, in jeopardy when we think about these sorts of changes. Well, we can speculate, and I've made up a few, and we can wonder whether these are sometimes what's going on, and in a few cases we know that it's what's going on. So sometimes the concern could be about a particular change in usage that's taken to be disrespectful or denigrating to a group of language users. Um, and you can see how if you're denigrating your audience, uh, that might impair the functionality of communication. So if, um, if you want me to open the window and you say, open the window, you drongo, you know, then I might take exception. I might not, too. I mean, you know, words like bastard and bitch can be uh, complimentary words. But, uh, you know, if you, if you use insulting language, um, that might be a bad thing. And if something happens that turns a piece of language into an insulting piece of language where it wasn't before, that might be a problem. And the classic example here is the word, um, the recent example is the word gay. Um, and people worry about its usage uh, to mean something like uh, naff or sort of problematic or sad or tired or embarrassing or uh, what, whatever. Um, some would say gay. You know, the word, reason the word is there being used like that is because it doesn't quite mean doesn't quite connect up with any, any other word. There isn't an exact synonym and it fills a niche. But a bunch of other people say um, there, is, um, there is an entrenched uh, usage of that word which connects it with a particular uh, sexual orientation and a lot of work's been done to try and stop um, that usage from being denigrating. And if you're going to use it with a, um, the pejorative sense, inevitably there's going to be some uh, fallout and there's going to be a connection between those two uses and it's not going to be a good connection and as a result people are going to be denigrated. So there's a, a very standard case of people opposing um, a particular innovation, being conservative about usage. Um, of course the word gay has lots of uses of course going back a long way 
um, but this is a, a war between two particular usages. And you can, this, is, this is a classic case where a lot of people are on the side of the, the preservationists. They don't, don't like this new innovation, and they'd like to try and, and stop it. So the idea of a, a particular usage um, or the change of a particular rule, in this case a semantic rule, a rule about the meaning of an expression, being denigrating might, be one of the, might, might often be, be a driver of, of um, uh, desires for reform or for preservation. Maybe sometimes, though, the worry is about the, it's just the aesthetics of the language. Certain words or constructions or turns of phrase might be regarded as more pleasant or noble or elegant or beautiful than others. Um, maybe that explains complaints about splitting infinitives. Maybe some people just, just find them ugly. Um, at other times, the worry might stem from the view that a natural language is a valuable cultural artifact. Um, arbitrary adjustments to the language make it difficult to preserve elements of the associated culture. Um, maybe there are certain spellings which people like because they remind you of the, the noble history of the word. Um, maybe this can be used to explain why there's such a, a drive to have um, Māori words spoken like Māori rather than Māori or Māori, uh, in, even when they're being used in English, and to, to put macrons over the noun, uh, over the vowels in, in, in those words. That's, um, that's a strong force. Maybe Again, cultural considerations are at play in France, where um, l'Académie Française is, is supposed to police the language. Um, and there's a similar organization in Israel that's supposed to police the development of, of modern Israeli Hebrew. And you know, maybe we can um, explain these in terms of this kind of um, uh, idea that, that uh, language is a cultural artifact and the culture ought to be preserved. Perhaps sometimes, and this is still under linguistic integrity, because I really am speculating here, perhaps sometimes the worry is simply that the language has rules and that we ought to observe rules. You know, rules are there to be observed. Uh, and um, we shouldn't have unchecked drift uh, in the same way that we should preserve, you know, if you're playing rugby, then play rugby. Stick to the rules. Don't, don't change the rules. If you're speaking this language, stick to its rules. Some people might say that's, um, that doesn't need any more justification than that. The rules have survived this far. Uh, maybe we don't know exactly what they're for, but maybe if we start violating them, we'll start to see that they, they actually were really cool rules to have. Um, rules surrounding the possessive apostrophe and, uh, and that kind of thing might, might fall into that category. And maybe sometimes the objection is simply that arbitrary drift in usage of language indicates corrupt mechanisms of knowledge transmission. So it's kind of, well, it's not about language really. It's not that we care particularly about rules changing in language. It's just that what that tells us um, about the people who are making these changes is not good, and we, we should check um, this kind of thing in general. After all, if people fail to learn the physics that their teachers passed on to them, or if people misapplied their knowledge of physics, we wouldn't be particularly thrilled because we might fear that bridges are going to fall down or that there might be more nuclear accidents. So even if linguistic drift is harmless in itself, maybe it indicates a laxness that bodes ill for education generally. You know, if people are taught something, they should do what they're taught. Um, so there's a range of, of um, reasons why you might think that it's... Um, it's okay to prom promulgate these sorts of things. And we can ask whether any of these ideas are, um, are any good. Um, we can ask whether um, these give us any reasons to, to, do this, to, to make these kinds of change and, or, or to, uh, to resist these kinds of change. And we're up against the fact that the sociolinguists and the historical linguists is always suggesting that language just marches on, things change. Um, and some people draw from that the moral that there's really no point in railing against, against um, the tide of change. And I, that's basically the moral that was fed to me when I did stage one linguistics. But I guess I think maybe that's a bit swift. Maybe actually um, we should draw a milder moral, which is something more like linguistic drift is, is, is here to stay. Things are going to change. So it's not worth trying to... to um, to resist change in one's language or, or artificially bring in new changes unless there's some really good reason. 
And so I guess what I'm thinking is that um, as a philosopher trying to make a bit of a difference in the world, um, I would like people to think about what it is that they're trying to do. Um, what it is that they're trying to do when they, when they want to conserve things um, and think, well, is it, is it really worth it? So actually step back and think about why they're trying to do it. Now, most of the examples I've given here about linguistic integrity have to do with, um, conser with, with, with uh, preservationism, as I was calling it, so trying to stop changes. But every now and then, in the interests of, of some of the um, things I've mentioned above under linguistic integrity, uh, people go for innovation. And there are some really weird examples of this kind of thing. Uh, and there's, there's a current one. This is from the Otago Daily Times. Um, Sky television commentator Ian, this was, this was um, sometime this week, my wife found it for me and I don't actually know which day it was, I should check. Sky television commentator Ian Smith dis um, was discovered a newfound love, discovered a newfound love for the word pure during the All Blacks opening test against Ireland. Do you know about this? I actually struck, I got this from um, um, Radio New Zealand's Media Watch program which is uh, an important source of a lot of stuff from me. Um, so the ODT says, the three-match test series is sponsored by Steinlager, which includes the popular Steinlager Pure, um, which is a, it's a kind of beer. So early in the match, Smith was asked for his opinion of a successful Ireland penalty kick, to which he commented, it was pure, wasn't it? The word was employed twice, nine minutes later, when All Blacks first five, Dan Carter, kicked a penalty of his own, um, what a pure strike that was. He had a good clearance area too, Smith commented. And Ireland have got to be very careful that they don't uh, infringe within, say, 55 metres in this first half because he'll cover that easily. That is pure. And, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it was hard to um, uh, avoid the conclusion that, that this rather unorthodox use of the word pure was driven by sponsorship. Smith denies it, but I don't know. How can you deny it? It's kind of weird. Um, it's pure rubbish. It's pure. Right? <laughs> that rubbish is pure. It's just pure. And, um, and the people on Media Watch were reminded, were reminded of something they dealt with in 2006. And actually, I don't know where this quote comes from. I found this um, very quickly on Google. Um, boutique New Zealand fashion label, um, ugh, Muchi, launched their summer collection to a select group of customers at their high street store last night. The store was packed for this very starkish unveiling of the new collection. However, not only were the clothes on show, but so was a very starkish refreshment. And this was part of a deliberate attempt um, by some um, vodka promoters uh, to get the word Starkish used in the media. And there was actually a competition for the sort of most Starkish use of the word Starkish or something. And um, <laughs> most interestingly, um, there was um, a petition. This is weird. Well, it's half weird. There was a petition to try and get Starkish into the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, um, I think actually the idea of coming up with a word and, and seeing how long it takes to get into the OED, is that, that's a good game. That's a genuinely good game. But you're not going to get a word into the OED by having a petition. Well, at least not unless it's a very special kind of petition. Um, like if it was a really, really famous petition, I guess you might get the word in. Um, but it's an odd way of doing it. So um, this kind of thing comes up every now and then. And the people on Media Watch um, back in 2006 interviewed the, um, the PR person who was behind this campaign about the use of the word Starkish and she said that it was a word for um, urban sophisticates who like nuanced communication. <laughs> so that's interesting you see because um, what we've been talking about so far are things that I put under the heading, the rather embarrassed heading of linguistic integrity as reasons for why you might um, want to make some changes. Um, and it, it's barely a functionality, but I tried to come up with some examples of it, you know, like um, maybe the language needs to be beautiful, maybe it's to do with preserving culture and so on. But if these urban sophisticates actually care about um, subtleties of communication, then we're onto something quite different and something that, that it's, it's um, easier to wrap your hand around, namely the idea that we might encourage um, certain sorts of usages and discourage others in the name of communicative efficiency and just, just having good communication. And sometimes maybe, for all I know, communication needs to be really subtle and nuanced. So that might be a reason for conservative, 
conservative and re reform. Um, and uh, the most extreme instance of this um, is the idea that it would be really good if we all spoke the same language. So this is where the universal language people come in. Um, Volopuk, as far as I know, was the first uh, popular um, universal language in modern times. But the one that most people have heard of is Esperanto. And um, I have a friend who actually um, learned Esperanto. Um, she's forgotten it, but she did learn it. And she forgot it largely because it didn't really catch on, which is a shame because the... Oh. <laughs> Why? What's the... Is there a, re... is there a story? She wants to get a Duke of Edinburgh award. Oh, yeah, well, that might work. Um, well, it... <laughs> No, you have to have a skill. <laughs> and she hasn't got one, so yet. Yeah, <laughs> a skill that you learned as part of, that you didn't Surely already have before you started. Yeah. there are skills easier than learning an entire language. No, 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 not for some people. Some people are really good at learning languages. Um, David is one of them, actually. I have several friends who, um, that's what they do for um, recreation. They learn a language they, um, or a code. Um, Two friends, one of whom is the one who learned Esperanto, and the other, other one is a, an inveterate language learner, um, worked in my office for a while. And um, I went away for a day to a department retreat. And I said, well, you don't have to come into work if you don't want to tomorrow. And they said, oh, well, we probably will, because it's fun hanging out. Um, and after the retreat, I came in the next day, and I said, well, what did you do? And they said, oh, we learned Braille. And they had, too. And they, they can read it with their fingers, and they could write it, and they used to pass me notes and stuff. Um, that no one else could read. It was terribly funny. That's, that's, uh, should have got Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Um, so these, th this they did in the interest of, of efficient communication. You know, there are times when you don't want, um, you want some people to know what you're saying um, and others not to, so they acquired the skill of reading Braille in order to do it. Some people thought that a universal language might be the way to do it. Um, but there are a bunch of worries about universal languages. Um, one is that it's very, very difficult to, to get them to um, to be free of the sorts of, sort of colonial influences that, that would mean people would, would feel that they were sufficiently neutral. Another worry is if you, um, if you hold some of Chomsky's views, you might think that a language like this had better conform to the sort of universal grammar um, that all languages allegedly conform to, because otherwise it'll just get changed the, the minute people, um, the minute it acquires native speakers, the, the minute people are born speaking it. Uh, another worry is that the whole thing's just a waste of time because the um, economy, the linguistic economy of the world is actually quite well attuned to, to this kind of problem. Um, large chunks of the, of, of the population of the world are in fact multilingual um, and in lots and lots of areas what you find is that a lingua franca has developed uh, a language that they all speak like um, Bahasa in Indonesia, um, um, English, and it used to be German. Europe, there are just these languages that multilingual people use to communicate. Tokpisan and, and other pigeons, and, or Tokpisan in Papua New Guinea, Bikilma in Vanuatu, etc. These are all languages um, whose main function is to enable people who belong to different linguistic groups to, um, to communicate. And you might think that's just as well, because if you like the idea that languages sort of encode cultures, then it might be good to sort of um, have it both ways. You might want um, a language that everyone can communicate in, and uh, also different languages. And we're certainly finding that increasingly in Auckland. You know, there's the, the Chinese Herald. There are radio stations on the guard bands um, that um, in w on which minority languages are spoken, and so on. Um, so there are lots of things that have been put forward in the name of um, improved communication, but um, there are a bunch of, I guess, mostly empirical reasons why you might worry about whether whether any of these are actually worthwhile. So that's communicative efficiency. Um, then there's learnability as a reason for reform. And um, that was, again, another one of the reasons that people came up with Esperanto. They, they thought that um, it would be good to have a language that everyone could speak that was sort of easier to learn than most other languages. Um, Probably the thing that we're most familiar with that's supposed to make languages more learnable um, is spelling reform. And uh, I don't know whether any empirical work's been done on whether the way the Americans spell colour as opposed to the way the people in the British Commonwealth spell colour um, has actually made that stuff more learnable. I'd be very interested to know. But certainly that's an example of um, a kind of movement that's, that's um, motivated by the desire to make language more learnable. Now, just in case you 
you thought that philosophy of language is really technical, um, I thought I'd throw in another kind of interesting little thing about um, the learnability of languages. Suppose you were as uh, suppose you were designing your own language from the bottom up, and some people do this, and there are websites devoted to it. One thing you might think is, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to have too many words. I'm going to keep the number of words small so that people can learn them, so that you know, they, so they can they can converse with a small number of words. I'm going to make it so that um, the way you get complex thoughts is by putting the words together and making sentences, um, but we won't need too many words. We'll economise on the number of words and we'll put all the effort into pe people knowing the constructions. That's the kind of thing that you might think would make a language more learnable. In fact, it probably doesn't because what you, what you gain in learnability of the atomic bits you lose in the learnability of the complexity of the constructions. So people are going to actually have trouble learning to put together the, the very long constructions. Um, and so what we find in, in most existing languages is a kind of a trade-off between um, the economy of the resources, the, 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 the bits of language, and, and the economy of, 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 of complexity. So if you're feeling like designing a language tonight, bear that in mind. It, um, if, you, if you want to make it learnable, you're going to have to pay attention to facts about um, the way the brain actually seems to acquire information, and um, that that will mean that some of the simple solutions you you might be tempted to come up with won't necessarily work. But anyway, um, learnability, trying to make languages more learnable or stop them from being less learnable, is another reason why people might, might want to engage in language reform. The last thing that I'll mention, and this will be the last thing I'll do, but it'll take a little, it'll take a, take a, a few minutes, um, is the idea that um, we ought to do something about language because a lot of language is imprecise. Sometimes it's thought that the usage of particular expressions needs to be regimented in order to avoid confusion due to imprecision. Um, some terms um, ought to be used more precisely because there's a tendency that we get the wrong ideas when we hear them. And we find debates, for instance, about the way terms ought to be used among various vocational groups. What the heck is an engineer? I play this game every now and then. You know, there are biomedical ones, civil ones, electrical ones, all sorts of different sorts of engineers. What do they have in common? Anything other than the fact that, you know, they all um, get trained at places that are called sort of engineering faculties. Um, and if we could find this thing that they have in common, does it distinguish them from, say, architects? Or should we call architects engineers as well? People get very worried about this. Should we restrict the use of the term engineer to people who um, share whatever commonality we find among all of these people? Because if we do that, we'd probably better stop calling train drivers and um, certain people who, um, who work in recording studios engineers. Um, you know, are they engineers? And um, what about people who just teach engineering? Yeah, what about those academic people that, that teach engineering? Um, should we call them engineers? Now, you may laugh, or you may not, but these are serious discussions that get held. Um, psycholo the, 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 psycho the psychological people in New Zealand, I can't remember which psychology association it is, but that's part of, this, part of the issue here, actually. Um, they got very precious a few years ago about who should be allowed to be called a psychologist and how the word, word ought to be used. But my initial exposure to this kind of thing was actually um, because my wife is a librarian, and years ago, actually not long after we got married, um, I went along to a meeting of the professional association, a talk by the profession, someone from the professional division of the library association, and he was talking about the the what what it takes to be a librarian, and I I went in there thinking, well, yeah, I, I guess you know that's kind of cool. Let's find out what librarians are. I wasn't a philosopher in those days, so I wasn't especially sceptical about this kind of thing. I came out thinking, there's, there's nothing that makes you a librarian. Absolutely nothing. Um, which was fine, except that this bloke was from the professional division, so he wanted me to have some positive view about this kind of thing. And what he managed to, to, to prove was that it's just a word. But people try and do this kind of thing in the name of, of um, precision. Um, and Skepticism about this kind of thing, the worry that a lot of our language is, is, is very imprecise in certain sorts of ways, has led people particularly to think that ordinary language is not a very good vehicle for describing the world, for describing um, the science of the world, um, for describing the, the basics of the world. And, um, and people have thought about this for a very long time. Leibniz in the 17th century was exercised by this. 
um, and uh, famously um, the philosopher and mathematician Gottlob Frege was interested in this and these people were interested in coming up with an artificial language like a, a formal language that we could use to to discuss science and do philosophy and so there's an interesting question is that a worthwhile project um, or should we just muck around with natural language a little bit well in order to give us some ammunition to think about whether it's a worthwhile project I'll just mention some of the sources of precision in natural language and these will mostly be familiar to you these are just reasons general reasons why people might think that natural language is imprecise in important ways so the most obvious sort of phenomenon is various kinds of ambiguity um, so there's lexical ambigu ambiguity which is what you get when a word has multiple meanings you know like bank um, and so you get sentences like, he wrote, a, he wrote a thesis on reinforced concrete. The word on is lexically ambiguous, right? Um, it could mean about or it could mean on. He wrote his thesis on reinforced concrete. Um, here's a sentence that's got two lexical ambiguities. The artist drew a club. That's a good one. Um, but this stuff's very, very common. Um, and in fact, we don't notice a lot of ambiguity because the context um, selects out for us the interpretation that we don't need to worry about. So take the sentence, the soldiers exchanged their arms for food. That's ambiguous, but you might not notice it. Um, and you might not notice the, 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 the ambiguity and the soldiers used their arms to protect their faces, but they're both actually ambiguous. And once you hear them together, you can, um, you can see that. Um, then... Um, there are other kinds of um, ambiguity. Um, there are ones that only crop up in um, speech, like homophony, when you've got two meanings that are associated with the same sound. Seven days without eating makes one week. And then there's the stuff that's a little bit harder to say, homography, which is when if it's written down, you can't tell. So it was blowing a gale and Connie was unsteady as she walked up the path because it was so windy because it was so windy. Um, if it's written down, you can't tell by looking, which it is. So that's a kind of imprecision. These are, you know, what's, what's meant there. There's nambiguity, um, which is a silly word for the fact that um, the same name is had by lots of different people. There are lots of bills, but we wouldn't want to say there's, there's, that there's lots of words bill. There's just one word bill, but it's a name for different people. And sometimes you don't quite know um, who's being referred to. My favourite in the family of ambiguity is polysemy, which occurs when one word or phrase has a number of very closely related meanings. Um, so it takes sad, a sad person, a sad face. Well, it's not that the face is sad like, it, like the person whose face it is, is, it's just that the face portrays sadness. A sad event. Well, the event isn't sad like the person. It's not feeling sadness, it's, nor is it sad like the face. It doesn't sort of exhibit sadness. It's more that... Um, the event itself um, had some sad aspects to it. Um, paint. This is my favourite. I paint pictures. I paint pictures. What do I do? Um, I'm, I create pictures by putting paint on some surface. That's what I do when I paint pictures. I paint houses. Well, that doesn't mean that I create houses by putting paint on some surface. Um, it could mean that I put paint on the surfaces of houses you know, so I get the house and I paint it. Or it could mean, I suppose, I paint houses, could mean I create pictures of houses by putting paint on some surface. So it's not like I paint a picture, I paint, a, I paint houses. What sort of painter are you? Are you a landscape painter? No, I'm a painter of houses. I, I, um, I do oil paintings of houses. So it could mean that. I paint nudes. That doesn't mean um, either of the first two. So it doesn't mean that I create naked people by putting paint on some surface. And lo and behold, you get these naked people. And it certainly doesn't usually mean that I put paint on the surface of naked people. You know, I paint nudes. What do you do? I get these nudes and I stick paint on them. It doesn't mean that. Um, it typically means the third thing. I create pictures of naked people by putting paint on some surface. So these are, um, again, there's imprecision. And a lot of the time, you might know um, because of the other words around what's going on, but the, the language itself um, needs help from the context so that you understand what's going on. Um, and there are 
kinds of ambiguity which are not to do with the with particular words, but just with the structure of the sentence, syntactic ambiguity. Um, we saw a sign somewhere near St. Luke's a few years ago which said, you mustn't miss our big jacket and pants sellout. You mustn't miss our big jacket and pants sellout. So what's big? Is it the jacket and pants sellout that's big or just the jacket? You mustn't miss our big jacket and pants sellout. You mustn't miss that either. Um, so um, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, so those are various kinds of ambiguity. There are other sorts of imprecision. There's vagueness, which occurs when expressions have meanings with unclear boundaries, you know, like bald. Am I bald or am I just bald aligned? Heap. How many um, grains of stuff does it take to have a heap? Um, we've, we've stopped talking about mainstream New Zealanders, haven't we? Isn't that a relief? Oh, man. But that's a vague term. Um, so that, that's another kind of imprecision. And then if you get really, really... Um, nerdy about language, you start discovering some very odd kinds of imprecision like paradoxicality. This is really why I needed David here. We're going to do, um, you know, so there are, there, are a bunch of, um, there are a bunch of famous paradoxes that are exhibited by language. Um, and sometimes you need to create a word to bring them out, but that's okay. So here's the heterological paradox, which is my favorite. Um, we're going to have two sets of words here, um, and the first set of words are going to be the non-heterological words. They're sometimes called orthological, but just to make it a bit easier, we might call them non-heterological. Um, English is one of these. Māori, polysyllabic, adjectival, and geological. These are all non-heterological words. Because if you put them in sentences, you can, go, you can do this kind of thing. English is an English word, eh? Māori, well, that's a Māori word. Polysyllabic, that's a polysyllabic word. Adjectival is an adjectival word, because it's an adjective. Geological, well, yeah, you could say that's a geological word. It's a word you might use when you're doing geology, I guess. Um, shut up, I'm being geological. So those are non-heterological words. So heterological words are words that don't have this feature, like French. French isn't a French word. Broken not a broken word. Endless isn't an endless word. I've already finished saying it. And monthly isn't a monthly word as far as I know. So those are, um, those are, those are the heterological words. Now, heterological is a word. Is it heterological or not? Well, let's see. Um, you know, if you've done some maths, you might think, here's a way of doing it. Let's Let's see if we can derive a contradiction from a supposition. So let's assume that it is heterological. So heterological is a heterological word. Well, it would be on the list with French and broken, wouldn't it? Because it's a heterological word. So we can say of it that it's heterological. We can say heterological is a heterological word. Whoops. If, if, if we can say heterological is a heterological word, and if that's true, then it must be on the other list, right? English is an English word. Um, Māori is a Māori word. Heterological is a heterological word. Uh, so, it's, so it's not heterological. So if you assume it is, you get that it isn't. And that's okay. But maybe that just means that it isn't. If you try to assume it is, you get a contradiction. So that means it isn't. Yay! We've finished. No, we haven't. Because it turns out that if we assume it isn't, we get that it is. So let's assume that heterological is not a heterological word. Well... That puts it on, that other, on the list with English and adjectival, right? So that means that the sentence heterological is a heterological word is true. Oh, but if that sentence is true, if it's true that heterological is a heterological word, well then it must, heterological must be a heterological word, so it must be on that other list, right? So what we've got is that if it is, then it isn't, and if it isn't, then it is. In other words, it is if and only if it isn't. Um, which, um, since I'm a logician, I can wave my hands around, uh, that's the same as saying that it both is and isn't. So heterological both is and is not a heterological word, and that's a problem. Um, that means that we've got a sentence in the language which is both true and false. Um, and that, that, seems like, um, that seems like something we wouldn't want to happen too often. Um, of course, we contrived it by creating a word, but there are plenty of uncontrived paradoxes, like the famous liar, which we can um, create just with ordinary words. We can have um, um, this sentence is false. 
the one I'm uttering now, this sentence is false. Um, that turns out to be paradoxical in the same way. I can't be bothered doing it. You can do that for homework. Okay, this sentence is false. Um, is it true or is it false? Well, it seems to be kind of both or something. So that's another kind of imprecision. And it is true that imprecision creates problems. I mean, think about public debate and just think about a case of ambiguity. We don't even need to go to something mad like heterodoxicality. Um, here's a bad argument. The media should report events that are in the public interest. This means that they should report events in the life of Kim Kardashian. Why? Well, because the public are interested in what she gets up to, right? Well, if the public are interested in that, then it's in the public interest, isn't it? Uh, well, depends. Depends what you mean by public interest. But these kinds of debates, uh, those sorts of arguments sneak through all the time. People pick them up. So you might think that it would be really good to reform language in the interest of trying to get rid of, of imprecision. Um, but you might also think that even if that's right, we shouldn't do it to the whole language because you might worry that um, there are certain places where actually imprecision is a really nice thing. Like in poetry, it might be, for, or just in evocative stuff, it might be that saying something that's ambiguous in the right kind of way actually um, is good because it, it sort of brings out both meanings. My favourite, although I've, I don't know anyone other than me who uses it this way, is you can't see the wood for the trees, which is ambiguous, right? Because if wood means forest, then what you're saying is um, you're, you're focusing it at a, a, a level of too much detail. You should be looking at the forest, um, but you're too busy looking at the trees. But if wood means timber, then it's the opposite, right? You can't see the timber for the trees. You're too busy looking at the bigger picture instead of the smaller picture. And what I like is that if you just say you can't see the wood for the trees, it, it can kind of bring out this idea that, well, I don't know, whatever level you're focusing at, it's the wrong one, mate. You should be focusing. <laughs> I think that's kind of cool. And of course, there are plenty of figures of speech that rely on this kind of thing, like the Zygma examples, like um, he and his passport both expired yesterday, and so those, those sorts of things. So you might think that imprecision um, is actually a valuable thing, and, and if we try and get rid of too much of it, that's going to be a problem. Um, It would be the death of puns. So the question would be whether puns, whether that would matter. And um, my friend Lewis makes puns. Ha! Too many, right? Yeah. Um, I used to make too many, um, and in those days I probably couldn't have done this bit because I, um, I I traded too much in, in puns. Um, but I guess what it's going to, I guess what that's going to come down to is, um, would you actually lose any expressive power if you didn't have puns? And um, the kinds of things that occur to me at this point are things like there are streets in New York with really boring names like 52nd Street and 5th Avenue, but man, they've got resonance. You know, 5th Avenue, you went to 5th Avenue. Yeah, I went to 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th. Yeah, I went to 5th Avenue. Oh, man, you stood on 5th Avenue. Um, that's, so it seems like even very clinical bits of terminology can acquire resonances. And the other thing I think about is, well, mathematics is beautiful. It's precise, but it's beautiful. At least it can be. And uh, so maybe if I were to say we, need, we want a precision because it's, it's a source of, of sort of beauty and richness and nuance, maybe that's too quick. Maybe in a, in a really precise, in a world where we spoke a really precise language, it would be okay. So I've kind of run out of things to say. What I wanted to do was to, obviously I haven't quite, have I? Um, what I wanted to do was to take the fact that people often suggest that we ought to be hanging on to old dying linguistic rules or suggest that we ought to innovate and introduce words like Starkish. And I tried to take that idea more seriously than I think the sociolinguists do. Um, and the way I tried to do that was to relate it to the idea that maybe we think language serves a bunch of functions and that it would be sad if it didn't serve them as well and that it would be good if it could serve them better and that that might be a way of anchoring this phenomenon um, that results in, in people doing this kind of a thing. And um, this is, that's as far as I've gotten with this project, and that's partly because it's, um, as I say, it's a, it's a project that my old supervisor thought was politically incorrect. It's not a, a standard project for philosophers these days, but I think it's philosophically very interesting, and I would like to take it further. And that's one of the reasons I gave it an airing, because I thought, well, let's see if you've got any thoughts about it. So um, have you? Have we got a bit of time to... We, anyone got some... Responses to that? <laughs> I've got an anecdote that I think is interesting. I don't really have a question. 
<laughs> That's mostly what I had too. <laughs> um, I was reminded of like in my first year at uni uh, about six years ago, um, I met this guy um, called Chris. Yeah, there are a lot of those, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he he had like he was studying this table, and he it all started because he'd read this medical article about um, a condition called failure to thrive um, of babies, which. Um, and then he started, he called his clothing label Thrive Clothing. And he started writing weekly um, articles in the Crackham newsletter, just really like, um, taking the word Thrive in a new, just like reappropriating it and using, like he called it Thriveology, and started using mm. Thrive, um, like sort of more about bombastic terms, like thriving on the weekends or. Like oh, nice. On, yeah. And, yeah. You know, drunk thriving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't drink. Don't drink yeah. yeah. Don't drink thrive. It tastes terrible. Uh. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's still going on, but he has two different Facebook accounts with the same name, and he just makes all these statuses about thriving on, and all, all his like friends have started using thrive instead of I don't know whatever the synonyms are. Mm, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I think it's sort of um, interesting. Yeah. And, and I think I, I like the idea that we should empower people to have a go at that kind of thing. Um, you know, it comes with risks. Most things do. Yeah, so that's my story. Mm, that's a nice, thank you, I like that story. Um, I thought just, um, <clears throat> if I could just add what I thought might be a good example to um, the uh, learnability one. The, um, I don't know that much about it, but the, the Chinese writing. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, every now and then they have a go at simplifying it, don't they? Yeah, it mm. seems like, well, from what I understand, the traditional Chinese writing is quite complex and takes many different strokes to write each character and um, just to make it more learnable, presumably, um, to get children able to learn it quicker and such. Um, it, I, I think the government has sort of tried to simplify it um, down, and I guess the preservationists might say that it's sort of losing something by doing that maybe mm. aesthetic um, value or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, the um, the linguists, the descriptive linguists won't, will, will be perfectly happy for you to do anything you like with the writing because they tend to study the, 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 the sound, the phonemics of the language rather than the, the graphology of it. Um, if people went in and tried to change some of the sounds, um, you know, like if you um, if you were a Frenchman and you said, let's get rid of the French, you know. <laughs> um, so you started speaking, how can I do this? You started speaking French like, the, no, I don't, I don't even know how you do it, but <laughs> you can imagine then the, the, um, the descriptive linguists would get really interested. Um, but, but writing systems, it's okay. Mm. because um, traditional Chinese, like, it's not actually just a picture. There are parts of each symbol that denote certain sounds. And in the simplified form, they've cut out some of those parts so that the writing is no longer phonetic in some parts. Like they've cut some of the phonetic parts out. So you might think one advantage of the non-simplified Chinese writing is um, an advantage that, for instance, most Indo-European languages don't have that it tracks the phonemics quite nicely. And, you know, wouldn't that be a nice thing to have? Why would you get rid of it? That's the debate, I think. Mm. You said that email that popped around a while back, which it, it, it had a, um, it was supposedly from the UN, but it was a completely tongue and cheek that was talking about um, standardising English. And they made a whole lot of logical um, rules why we should change the way we write. And as the letter went on, they adopted those rules. And by the time we got to the end of the page, <laughs> but each time you read it, it was like, well, that makes perfect sense. But when you combine them all together, you had this complete yeah. shitstorm. Mm. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen that. I'd like to see that. It was the EU. It's like standardized oh. English for the United States. Um, for the EU. Yeah. <laughs> but if they got down the first couple of months, that makes, yeah. that makes sense by the time the end of it, uh, probably yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> I was 
it's interesting the um, sort of sociological stuff you talked about. Would you be able to say anything more about um, what language says about, I guess, both um, the person using it and, and how different uh, social groups talk, and also like what the language as a whole says about the society? Oh well, there's, there's, a, so, there's an awful lot of stuff about this. You know, there are people who think that. Um, uh, there are particular things missing from certain languages, certain concepts, and that means that those people, the people who use that language, don't learn those concepts. And then there are other things. I take notions like ame in um, Japanese and um, Schadenfreude, which is a word for a, a toilet. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just off to the Schadenfreude. You know that? Uh, same thing. Um, <laughs> You know, so there's, the, there's um, these are these are um, words about which some people think, oh, well, these these are concepts, and in those two cases, emotions, or something, uh, which you might not have, or you might not might not be made salient to you by your language. So your language can can shape your culture just because um, it makes certain concepts available. Um, oh yes, this is a bit from the Hitchhiker's Guide that most of you won't know because it's only in the radio series. Um, uh, the um, a lot of people think that, that most people are having a much better time than they are. Uh, in fact, um, English speakers have an expression for this, which is that the other man's grass is always greener. The Sheltonac people of Brid Kutrin 13 had a similar phrase, but because their planet was somewhat eccentric, botanically speaking, um, the best they could manage was the other Sheltonac's dupleberry ju shrub is always a more mauvey shade of pinky russet. And so the expression fell into disuse, and the Sheltonac's had nothing for it but to sit down and live long and happy lives, much to the annoyance of everybody else in the galaxy who had failed to realise that the best way not to be unhappy is not to have a word for it. So, um, you know, there's the... That's, that's Douglas Adams um, having a go at what's called the um, wharf sapir hypothesis, which is that there are, um, uh, your language shapes your culture because of the sorts of concepts that it has. Um, and then there's a debate of Stephen Pinker in, the, um, in one of his very popular books, uh, The Mind Instinct, I think it is, um, says, no, 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 basically all languages give us all the same concepts and that's not the sort of thing. That happens, but you know, you get stuff in George Orwell, um, Newspeak in 1984 is supposed to be an example of trying to control people by controlling the concepts that are available to them through their language. But the basic thing to say about this, I guess, is that language is, um, and this, I guess, yeah, language is, is behaviour really. Um, uh, maybe it's a bunch of other things, but it's behaviour. We do things with words. We perform actions when we speak and write. Uh, and you know, we ask, we command, we assert. These are forms of action. And so um, the use of language plays the kind of role in a culture that any other kind of behavior would, any, any sort of ritual or any particular way of, of walking um, might play in a culture. It's just more stuff. It's just more um, actions. And so the palette of actions that, that language makes available to you is going to be very much part of your culture. And um, I don't know. There's a, that, that to me is sort of the basic insight, and um, you can take that in all sorts of directions. It just is going to be the case that cultures behave in all sorts of different ways, and some of those ways are going to be linguistic, and then a lot of that's going to be encoded in their literature, and there'll be a feedback loop because people within a culture might read mostly that literature, and that will entrench the behaviours that are associated with language, um, and so on. Um, so I'm, that's, that's at a very general level, um, but... The whole of sociolinguistics is, is, is about this topic, really. Um, there are all sorts of nice empirical findings, like that um, minority groups in large cities uh, don't tend to assimilate. They tend to hang on to their language, um, they, and, and they group together. And you know, This is just kind of an empirical finding that you might expect that minorities would get swallowed up. But if they've got communication with each other, then um, they, uh, they won't. And, the flip side of that, of course, is that when they took um, slaves across to, to the Americas from Africa, they deliberately mixed them all up so that they couldn't communicate with each other in their own languages. And so what developed were, were pidgin languages, which were languages that were based on, um, on um, the, the fragments of stuff that were around, and in particular the sort of colonizing language. And pidgins are interesting because 
sometimes people grow up speaking them. They learn them as native languages, and when that happens, they change. Uh, and so this is sometimes used as evidence for the, for the Chomskyan hypothesis of a universal grammar, because people um, grow up learning languages that were invented a generation ago, just as a, as a rough form of communication. Um, but they evolve in a particular way that means that they're more like other natural languages. They share some of the, the um, deep similarities that natural languages allegedly share. And then, then they're called creoles. So, uh, so there's all sorts of f fun phenomena like that that you get by studying sociolinguistics. I don't know who's teaching it now. I saw something interesting like that about um, sign languages. Where oh, yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, you, you do it. <laughs> No, 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 no. Was it that children learned sign language and then, like, it once they started using it to communicate with each other, they it sort of became more complex? Well, the, the thing I know about is almost directly analogous to the stuff about pigeons and creole. So what would happen is that um, deaf children um, would, their parents would need to communicate with them somehow. So they would sort of develop signs. Um, they would, um, you know, they'd just make up stuff. And the children would make mistakes sometimes, you know, if the thing got too complicated. And the mistakes that they made were the kinds of mistakes that showed that they were trying to get their language to conform to the sorts of complex structure-dependent rules that you find in other languages. And these are the rules that, um, that you find in, in, in actual sign languages. So when they start learning their own sign languages, they, um, they sort of take those on board and they very quickly forget the stuff that their parents taught them. That's the... That's the empirical stuff I knew about. None of this is, um, is strictly speaking, philosophy, of course, but it's about language. That's very interesting. Right, yeah. Well, yeah, well, I guess that's precisely the issue I was trying to get to. So if someone says, oh, um, let's, let's bring it about so that we can um, have it that, to boldly split infinitives that no man has split before, and, and you say, no, no, you shouldn't say that. You should say to, and split, to split finitives, infinitives boldly that no, no one has split before. Let's not have a man, because that's too sexist. Well, OK, you knew what was being said, what, what exactly is going on there. And that, that was kind of my starting point, I guess. My starting point was, well, um, if it doesn't really matter, then does it matter? And the answer would have to be, well, yes, I knew what you meant, but there are other things that are being compromised here. Communi communication isn't the only value. There are some other values, and like, well, what are they? Um, the, there's the learnability of the language. There's precision. There's, um, there's the stuff about um, whether you might be denigrating various cultural groups and so on. And I guess what I was, if I was arguing for anything, it was that you ought to have, if you're going to press that kind of thing, if you're going to say, no, this is what you should say, uh, then you ought to have some story about what it is your, what the functionality is that you're trying to optimize. Um, and this applies to people like me because, you know, if you're writing papers, if you're writing journal articles, or if you're correcting people's essays, you, you do this kind of thing. You do become the style counsel, and there'd better be a story. Um, so my thought was, yeah, people do know often what you mean, but maybe there's more to it than that. And of course, in the case of precision, it will, to some extent, be about what you mean, maybe people who aren't in your in context won't know what you mean. But um, yeah, that was why it's supposed to be important to us. Um, yes, you, the question you're asking is a very good question. If people um, know what you're getting at already, why are they trying to correct it? Well, I'm suggesting a range of answers, uh, but maybe none of them will work in a lot of cases. That was philosophy. <laughs> I have a, sort of a question sort of about precision. Um, to what extent do you think it's legitimate to worry that there'll always be meanings that won't be covered by words. I mean, if you look at just sort of, I'm not feeling very eloquent, but you can get a lot of words that have almost the same meaning, but because you've grown up speaking English, you understand that they have different 
situational context, maybe, with only a very fine distinction between mm-hmm. the two, when you're using the one. So you could say that um, if you're going to intentionally make language more precise... Well, to make it intentionally more precise. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you're possibly always going to miss out on specific things. It's not like a formal language in that respect. So... Well, you could add some more words to capture some of the other ones, I guess. Then, I mean, then you're always, you're always going to have the ability to force some neologisms. Well, that might be what you need to do if, if, mm. if you're trying to get precision. Um, there, is, there, is, um, there are upper limits on, on the expressibility of language, on how much language can do, and um, it's, it's quite possible that meaning that there just will never be enough words to get all the meanings that we could in principle get. There's, there's, there's formal proofs of that, because um, you're never going to get... There's a, there's a really dirty proof that... Um, I'll give you the hand-wavy version of the dirty proof. Um, it turns out that, that for any natural language, there'll be as many possible sentences in that language as there are natural numbers. You can order them, and the natural numbers go on forever, and there are going to be infinitely many sentences, so there'll be as many as the natural numbers. But there are more real numbers than there are natural numbers. And, and there aren't, we know, there aren't enough names for all, the na- for all the real numbers. There's no way of naming them all. You try and write them down and some of them will be non-terminating decimals, so you won't get, you won't, you won't get finitely long strings that correspond to every single natural num- uh, real number. And um, that's, that's important because any linguistic expression in the kinds of languages we're talking about are are, um, they have to be finite strings. Yeah. So if you take, if you say, well, for every real number there's a fact, like there's the fact that that's a real number, you know, pi's a real number, seven's a real number, e's a real number, tau's a real number, 183.7092 recurring is a real number, they're all real numbers, they're all those facts. There isn't enough language to express just all of those facts about real numbers. So if you think of each of those facts as corresponding to a meaning that um, a linguistic expression could have, well then, yeah, there aren't enough expressions to go around. So there are, um, it seems like there are things we might want to say or talk about, which we, um, we can't do it all at once. We can't have a language that will cover all of them. Yeah, um, yes, yeah, so there's a question about whether it matters that there's a whole lot of stuff we'll never be able to talk about. I mean, if it's just the names for real numbers, heavens, you know, does it really matter? Um, is, it, is it significantly more than that? Well, it might be points in the universe or something. Um, but, um, you know, there are infinite, we can create infinitely many more ne- neologisms and there'll still be infinitely many more neologisms we can create. So it's not like we're going to, it's not like the creativity or productivity of language is going to run out. Um, we'll never reach the, the limit. Um, the limit is Aleph Null, but we'll never reach it. So, um, but, but yes, maybe there are some, maybe, you know, there, maybe there are infinitary beings that can comprehend infinitely long strings, uh, and they, um, they just understand all sorts of things more than we could possibly imagine. And maybe it's a bummer that we can't do that. You know. <laughs> it was that sort of a meaning approximation of what he's seeing, right? And would it really matter if they were Jump called short. shorts as opposed to trousers? Or, you know, French with apples and potatoes. Hmm, mm, yeah. Does it matter, really? Does it matter? Does it matter what things are called? You can just sort of, you can approximate them to the nearest well, it matters for communication. Like if somebody came and said, oh, I bought myself a new pair of jumper shorts the other day, I may or may not know what... <laughs> and I probably would assume I didn't, because I think, oh, these are obviously some new kind of shorts that I wasn't previously aware of, right? I wouldn't think, I wouldn't think oh, that's a cool name for trousers. Um, I'd only think that if I had reason to think that this person didn't know some of these words. So, um, so yes, it does matter, because in a community we want to use the same words, and it's quite hard to communicate with people when you don't have a common vocabulary. Um, Yeah, yeah, the short, yes, that's right. Efficiency is, goes with um, um, 
contraction and so on. Yeah. Mm. Well, I guess we have words for things we, need, we think we need to talk about, and sometimes words fall into disuse, like anti-disestablishmentarianism, which is only used in discussions about language. Um, or the Church of England. <laughs> well, England yeah. yeah. Um, More towards one word. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? But there's a perfectly good word for it, but they're, and they're supposed to be uh, most proficient in the ones that are most versatile. So you're, so, so you're one of my people on this, right? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, 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 <coughs> so you're a good test case. I mean, so am I on lots of things. Um, I hate people talking about growing companies and growing a business. I hate that. It's not tomatoes, it's a business. Um, but so okay, so so can you can you say what it is you don't like about ironically, like in term, you know, like what's the problem if you know what if you know what's being said? I've got to stop and think about it for a mm -hmm. bit, and yeah. hunt through the entire story to work out if there is any irony there, and then inevitably we go, there is none. It's a coincidence. When did you get <laughs> but shouldn't you just get with the program? I mean, this is what people are you, this is what people are saying <laughs> well, you know, now. It might take you a while, you know. There is no ironic situation, and we're now start going to say coincidentally, are they going to switch positions? So your worry might be, um, if they start using the word ironically to mean coincidentally, what are they going to say when, they, when there's a real irony? Of course, those sorts of people just aren't, are they? They're never, never going to. Um, you know, it might be a niche thing. These people always say ironically when they mean coincidentally. Um, but among your mates, you know, they know what irony is. and they'll. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just fun to try and think through exactly what the problem is. Uh, I hate it too. That could be a loss of integrity if you, you want to go back and read Shakespeare mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's dramatic coincidence. <laughs> oh gosh, how coincidental was that? <laughs> So, um, yes, I see, yeah, right. Um, uh, could, you, uh, could you get rid of a whole bunch of names and replace them with descriptions of what the thing is and, and get... Um, well, this is roughly what we do in metaphysics. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that's what was driving a lot of the stuff I was talking about with Leibniz and that crowd. Um, they, um, you want to, those people want a language that's got... The, the symbols of the language, like the words, cover the really basic bits of reality, and then everything else is constructions out of them, so that you can see what they're all made of, um, so that you can, so that the linguistic expression wears on its face um, the derivation of the stuff from all the um, composing stuff. Um, but mostly, we don't want that, because for us, an apple um, has a special significance that all sorts of other bits of things put together out of other things doesn't. Let alone metaphors like you know, pomme de terre. It's getting close to seven o'clock, and my camera's just about out of battery, so maybe time for one last question. <laughs> Anyone want to take the last question? It's a little bit The polite question. Okay, well, I'll do it because I like taking the last piece of paper. Um, it, it, it seems in a, a few of these situations we're talking about introducing new words or trying to get people to use words differently, like we might not want people to say gay in a bad way because that seems sort of... You're gay, but not in a bad way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I'm spoiling the last question. I'm sorry. Um, it seems like... I mean, you can talk you about say that it's gay. Theory, but it seems incredibly difficult to actually get anybody to actually use the words. So 
I might try and introduce a new word in philosophy because it's I need a, a new word to be more precise, but nobody actually takes it up. Then we just have to go back to using the old words and being ambiguous. Mm -hmm. or... Yeah, I think it. I've, I think it would be fun to try and do um, a Starkish kind of thing and to see if you can get a word in. Now, pre presumably, thrive is an example of how this can be quite successful. All you need is a cult. Uh, you know, you get a cult, um, and um, I mean, I, uh, I, I shouldn't tell the story because you'll never invite me back, but I'm going to tell it anyway. I, um, you know, in this building you can get Belgian biscuit. <clears throat> you know, you shouldn't say Belgium. It's a really, it's a disgusting word. Just don't, don't say Belgium. It's a really, this, this is a cult thing. But every now and then these things catch on and they get, um, so some of us know that Belgium's a, the most disgusting word in the universe, but a lot of people don't realise that. Um, but it is. Uh, and, and every now and then these things catch on, um, and, and you don't know when they will and when they won't. So I would say, in my lifetime, the word gay, um, when I was little, the word gay was not used in um, ordinary circles to, to, with its, its meaning that it's to do with sort of sexual orientation and stuff. When it was used, uh, it just meant to kind of happy and stuff. And I became aware of the other usage when I was about 10 or 11. And in a very short time, um, that word got co-opted. Now, of course, the usage is way older than that. But its um, acceptance as a, gen as a general term by the public has been remarkably quick um, in, in our culture. And, uh, and this happens. You know, words shoot up from nowhere and suddenly everybody's saying them. Uh, going forward, people will do this again. <laughs> uh. You know, that's something that was intentionally created and became nationwide practically overnight. So know? there are people, yeah, people who think they're good at this, and some of them actually are. So I think if you say, look, I want to start a craze and invent a new word, yeah, maybe you won't manage it. But sometimes it obviously does get managed, and it, it's the kind of thing that maybe people could learn how to do, and some people maybe have. And of course, there are these urban sophisticates who are just dying for new words. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure, am I, am I addressing the right thing? I guess all I'm saying is, yeah, it might seem like you just haven't got a, sh a hope, but sometimes things catch on. Yeah, and then other times they, they just don't. Yeah. Like the word um, bright is a good example where people like Daniel Dan and others have tried to use yeah, well, the word bright to mean a naturalist as uh, using the analogy of the word gay, just sort of a positive sounding word to try and remove some of the stigma with words like atheism in some places. I mean, it just hasn't really caught out. You know, I'm kind of glad it too, because it makes it sound as though. Um, that goes with being clever or something, that the clever people have this view, and well, that's... Is this is already a perfectly good existing word yeah, that yeah. serves functionally, that except for a few people who are trying to change it, most people are just defaults mm. to atheist or, you know, humanist or some, you know, some of the different words that can work for that, and so... Like, it's not clear there's a niche that needs to be filled. Exactly, mm. there's nothing that's missing, there's a lack really for people. Mm. That's that may have been true of gay as well. I think with gay, there were just a whole bunch of words um, that were being used, and that was the one that uh, um, has become... Well, really, Daniel Dennett's point was that <coughs> you had a whole lot of nasty, disparaging words to describe homosexuals, and they kind of co-opted the word gay into the mentality and gave it a positive spin. What was gay originally a and nasty, and like, was it originally intended as that? I, my understanding was that it was originally a word that was used as kind of like a... Like an innuendo, mm. exactly. It was more subtle, yes, it was yes. like the word you can use Saying he's it's a marvelous party. She is a homosexual, but it's a, a way of saying it's kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Mm. Mm. Madly gay. Yeah, mm. <laughs> but if they'd taken the word queer, which is another word that's used, that, that's that's you know that would have probably been okay, and people would have thought, what a positive word, you know. It's just that we that that isn't what happened, and and some people do prefer the word queer. Uh, so. I think we should use earnest again. Yes. Or Frank, one or the other. Often it seems like you have like a word and it has a negative connotation, so you create a new word, but then mm. the new word just takes on the negative. Yeah, that's right. That's that's common. So you get that. That's handicapped, disabled, impaired. I don't know why anyone thought any of these had a positive spin, but they obviously thought the other one had a negative spin. So they bung bung, bung these ones in, and it just you just get all the trappings back. Yeah, and I think that's happened with gay too. <laughs> it's just not PC, whereas with us, that's where all the signs say that's what's normal. 
you know, and to, it's, um, and yeah. if you say disabled, then it comes across as being too try hard, I guess. I mean, it, it's That's right, yeah. Used, mm. Of course, alien is the American one that um, gets some of us, you know. <laughs> Aliens this way. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Describing countries with different levels of GDP is one of the areas in which there's just been an enormous amount of linguistic reform. Mm. I think the trendy one at the moment is to say north and south. And that one bugs me a little bit because I read south. North and south. And I think, yeah, the north, is, mm. north is rich countries and south is poor countries. So um, Australia creeps in because the line goes below Australia? Well, <laughs> as far yeah. as I can tell, well, when I read like these things, they're talking about making changes in Antarctica. I want to know what, what most people think the second world is. But you have, to, you have to reconstruct it. I always thought the second world, when I was growing up, was the Americas, and the third world was kind of like, you know, the stuff that got imperialized in the 19th century. But now, uh, and we would be the third world on that story, but then Winston Peters started saying, oh, you know, we, we're, um, we're barely a second world country, and we want to be a first world country. Oh, what, what, are we, what are we with if we're in the second world? And, I, and, and if you look it up on Wikipedia or some authoritative thingy like that, you get all sorts of different stories about what first, second, and third world mean, and whether there's a fourth world, and so on. Everyone wants to be in the first world. I'm not sure why. So there's all of those. <laughs> they won before the game started. Thanks for coming along. Um, oh, thanks for having me.